Good morning. It's Pastor John Bales from Twinbrook Community Church in Rockville, Maryland. I welcome you to this presentation we have together today. Today we're going to have some singing, some worship. We're also going to have communion. Pastor Milson is going to bring us communion. That's going to be followed by a message from the Gospel of Mark. I'm very excited to hear and see these messages from the Gospel of Mark. And um, I look forward to the day when we'll stand together looking eyeball to eyeball and um, in each other's presence and continuing in this same series. It's been a um, glorious time in the Word. And we've had weekday Bible studies. We'll pick up again in March with our <clears throat> Wednesday night Bible study, continuing in the second half of the book of Acts. And I welcome each of you as you come and as you participate both in this presentation that we have this morning and then also as we um, enter into the other Bible studies we have during the week. So welcome. It's been a, a good week. We've had good news come to us in many different ways. There are other people that we're continuing to hold up as they are going through difficult times. I think particularly about our daycare director, Leticia Banks. We need to keep her in our prayers. She is um, she's suffering today and she needs our prayers for healing and restoration. And also for our brother, Brian Phillips, who is looking at surgery this coming week. We wanna keep him lifted up in prayer and others that we have been praying for already both people that we know through this, our, our community, our Christian uh, church, and also through friends and family. We give thanks to God for his sovereign rulership over our lives and over his world. And we ask you to uh, join us as we pray and we seek the Lord together and as we worship in this manner until we meet again. Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Your word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. As the Lord has prayed, that we will come into a knowledge of the truth in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. Lord, I pray that during this time, as we give ourselves to prayer for one another, and as we concentrate our focus in, in the morning or the afternoon or the evening in your word. I pray, Lord, that you will indeed speak to us by your word. We thank you, Lord, that you, you exercise your lordship in our lives through the scriptures, the Holy Bible. And we thank you, Lord, for this mystery. But yet we thank you, Lord, for this sure word of prophecy that we have received from you. And we thank you, Father, that you refresh our souls by it and you warn us and you, you heal us and rebuke us and comfort us and build us up and exhort us. And we thank you for that, Father, by your word. And may we hide, as, as the psalmist says, in our hearts that we might not sin against you. We love you, Lord. We praise you for one another and for this time we have together. Come, let us worship the Lord. God bless you this week.
We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness to us. We love you, Lord. Amen. couple of weeks as we have been contemplating communion together, I have shared brief thoughts concerning uh, our going to be with the Lord, being united together with him in eternity, how communion focuses upon uh, that future point in time in our lives. And I wanted to visit it once again today uh, briefly, uh, connecting together what happens here and what will happen in the future when we are with the Lord. In looking at the book of Philippians, particularly the first chapter, we see that the Apostle Paul is going through a time of great difficulty, personal distress. And yet in the midst of the distress that he's going through, it's remarkable that he speaks of joy. He mentions the word joy four times in that first chapter. 
And we might wonder, well, where is or what is the, the cause of this great joy that he's having in the midst of a, a time of great distress? And we discover the answer in another word that is used frequently in that first chapter. As a matter of fact, this particular word is used 18 times in the first chapter. And that word is Christ. Jesus Christ is mentioned 18 times in the first chapter of Philippians. It's rather remarkable number of times. And we might connect together then that the reason why the Apostle Paul could experience such joy in his life was because the supreme object of his faith and love was found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he says in that first chapter, was and is his life. That is the situation for us. We find that Jesus Christ is our life. Uh, he is the one uh, uh, towards whom our great affections are expressed and attached. Well, the scriptures also tell us that while we live here, we are enrolled in heaven. Already, as we are on earth, we are enrolled in heaven. And the scriptures tell us that there's going to come a time when we shall be numbered among those who are the spirits of just men made perfect. In heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ will dominate everything. That will be the scene. His glory, his majesty, uh, the, the greatness of his grace and his love for the saints, his reign, his rule, and we shall bask in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul on earth had a great experience of knowing the presence of Christ in his life, and that was the cause of his great joy when we are in heaven, in the presence of the Lord, where all hindrances of earth are taken away we shall look at the Lord Jesus Christ and see him in all the beauty and the majesty that he possesses. And we shall fall down before him. He is here and now uh, and in the present, uh, the supreme object of our faith and our love. And today, as we celebrate communion, we celebrate that reality. We're united together with Christ here and in a greater sense in the future. And as we take communion, we are looking forward to what it is that he is going to be doing for us or what we will experience in the future, as well as focusing upon the present realities that we have in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for faith in Christ, that your spirit has quickened us to life. We are thankful, Father, that in your causing us to be born again, we have this knowledge that we have an imputed righteousness because of Christ, and we have the forgiveness of sins because of Christ, because of what he has accomplished upon the cross for us. We celebrate today our life in Christ, both now and in the future. He is the supreme object of our love and our faith. We confess it together today. The scriptures tell us that on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had Given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let us take together. The scriptures go on to say that after supper, the Lord Jesus took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us take the cup together. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Well, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Mark, the first chapter, and verse 21 through 28. Would you stand with me as we honor God's Word and read this together? They went to Capernaum, 
And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as, the, as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Thank you, Holy Father, for these words today. Thank you, Lord, that we hear within them the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I thank you, Father, that this is not just intellectual idea gathering, but this truly is something that is revealed from heaven. And the same person that we see quoted here as he lived and as he walked and he moved, and he spoke, and he cared, and he reached out, and he just, even his presence was something that caused wonder and amazement. And I pray, Father, by your Spirit, that we can recognize that we, like these two sets of brothers that we've seen so far here, we're called. We're called from wherever we were before to where we are now in Christ, in your kingdom, in your mission. And I pray that will be something that truly touches our heart in the same way that has touched every person that we've seen mentioned here in this prologue in these first verses of this Galilean ministry. We truly ask you to open our eyes today that we might behold wondrous things from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the God. You can be seated. This is a magnificent text of Scripture, magnificent book. We have, have you been reading this each day and each week before you come? The things that I uh, was, and I've told you this before, when I was um, studying in, long ago in st- seminary, I was encouraged to read the whole book or letter that was being preached upon. And so I'm very faithful in being able to do that when we're in the first chapter. But as we move on forward further and further, it gets more and more cumulative, and so it takes a greater commitment to keep up and um, with that kind of a thing. I'm not suggesting we do that. I think that, he, that the professor at that time was talking about the book of Corinthians, which also is a you know, 45-minute read. And... Um, But it's important that we read the text. And so as we discuss this, it doesn't sound like, well, where are we? What are we talking about? It's important that we prepare ourselves by reading the text. And so we're going to continue on through this entire book this way. And I encourage you to read the text of Scripture through the text of Scripture that either is announced or you anticipate will be the next section for teaching in this series. And we've, we've, I've told this many times, haven't I? So this is not the first time I've heard this, this statement. But it's important that we have that connection to God's Word. By the way, if you don't have a Bible with you today and you need one, or I hope you'll need it, um, but if you would like to have one to follow along, there's, I see at least one back there, and I think there's three back there. So if you want someone to go back and get one, um, we'll be glad to let you borrow that for the day. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. 
This follows around the heels, of course, of Jesus calling the two sets of brothers, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, follow Jesus on and on. Yeah, that's the first part of the poem that hopefully we can learn as we go. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And, and here they are, these persons that have literally just perhaps moments before they have been called by Jesus to follow them. It's clear that this is a view, this is a, a text that Mark at least sees as being contiguous and perhaps even the same day. Um, now if that's, a, if that's true, if this is the same day, then he calls people that are working on Saturday. Is there any problem with that? No. Oh, it's the Sabbath. So you're supposed to do anything on the Sabbath? Two of them were just casting nets and two of them were cleaning nets and under the supervision of a father who was cleaning nets who had two other higher hands that were doing something over there with the nets. And so we see this in objective position, wrong context for being to be reporting on. But Mark is reporting on this because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And as a result, the Sabbath, as he said, was not made for man to struggle under, but man, so the Sabbath is not made for man, but man is made for the Sabbath. It's, a, it's, it's there for us to worship and to give our praise to God upon. And of course, as a, we know within church history in the context of what we're doing here on Sunday, Monday, or Sunday, the first day of the week, that this was something that an early church changed as a celebration of the resurrection of the Lord, and they called it the Lord's Day. And there's been a lot of debate on whether we should call today the Sabbath. And um, However, <clears throat> we're not limited today, are we? Epistle to the Hebrews tells us that all of life, all of time, every day is our Sabbath rest because Christ has accomplished everything for us at the cross and we no longer need to come on a day to try to bring sacrifices for repentance and sacrifices for praise to God because we're always in this day of rest. We're always on our Sabbath rest. So it's Sunday and it's Monday and it's Tuesday and it's Wednesday, but for the sake of corporate worship, we come together on the Lord's Day, the day of His resurrection. That's why I talk about the resurrection of the Lord. And as a result, we see the same kind of setting aside of this time. Now, this could be other days. I've known people, like I know a couple people that can't come to our church because, or on a Sunday morning because they're working every Sunday morning. And as a result, they have a difficulty. Well, you say, well, you know, you're, first thing I'd like to point out that you're breaking the Sabbath. Well, first of all, you're not even talking about the Sabbath. You're talking about Sunday, so it's the first day of the week. But, but you see, we, we automatically want to put things on this kind of Jewish Hebraic kind of level of how much do we do to be righteous? How often do we do it? When do we do it? Where do we do it? And all those things are evidences within our own hearts of sweeping away of those restrictions and bringing to glory and thanksgiving and praise for what Christ has done for us, the Lord of the Sabbath. We look at the Lord of the Sabbath. We don't worship the day, we worship the Lord of the day. But here they are, these fishermen, and they're called in verse 21, just on the heels of their calling, it said, they went to Capernaum. Now likely they were already in the vicinity of Capernaum, was where Peter and Andrew and James and John had their fishing businesses. But somewhere in Capernaum, and later we see in a parallel, the Synoptic Gospels, we see Mary, mother of Jesus, and his other siblings, are with him, and that says, in Capernaum. And so the, the center of all the Galilean ministry that we're going to read about for the next six chapters, this whole time when Jesus is in Galilee ministering, all over Galilee, all these places kind of go back to the repose of his, his home in Capernaum. Some of the disciples said, where do you live? And he said, come and see. Well, he didn't live under a tree somewhere. He had a place, and he 
Very likely the place where they gathered when they heard about him and they, these men brought that paralytic man. Remember the paralytic man's brought and they tore the house off, tore the roof off somebody's house. Just before that time, it's Jesus' house. They're tearing the roof off his house. So I, I guess he... Never mind. We see him having this touch and contact with humanity as he was baptized into the sin, into the reprobation of humanity. And now he comes forth to actually live among them, be among them, call them, call sinners. He calls sinners to be his companions. Why? Because he's not about judging people. He's about saving people. And he is fishing already. <laughs> it's hard to find titles for these sermons, by the way. I mean, if you look at, the, you look at the, your headings in your Bible, you see these, these headings. Jesus drives out an evil spirit. Well, that's not what this whole thing is about. I mean, it's about some other things. He does drive out an evil spirit. But we see that it's more complex than that. Because we're seeing Jesus announcing the coming near coming of the kingdom of God, and then he is the Messiah bringing in that kingdom. He now is coming into a place where he is going to demonstrate it's not near, it's not sometime soon, it's now because he is now. The king and his kingdom coming into its reign. The town. But during this um, whole section, he's going to basically work around Galilee, the whole Galilean area. And as I said, it's, it's somewhat of a headquarters for this Galilean ministry. And very likely it's a home that Jesus himself had acquired somewhere. Either its use or in some way had acquired it. But I want to just for a moment touch on this word they. Because no sooner were the four brothers called to their fishing expedition with Jesus from their fishing work on the Sabbath, as he called sinners to come and follow him, and he was going to fish for men. But they found themselves not only just coming to hear a little bit about this, you know, give us an interview, Jesus, you know, we'd like to show you our resume, and you can show us what your plans are. Give us your five-year plan. You know, Jesus, unfortunately, didn't have a five-year plan, did he? Right? He had a three-and-a-half-year plan. So we see him as not a really good businessman, perhaps. I don't know, according to today's standards. But they found themselves already up to their necks in ministry. These sinners, these untrained persons, these persons had no idea who Jesus was or what he was doing, but they had followed him. And it says now they went to Capernaum and, and it doesn't show here in the NIV, you know, shame on the NIV translators, but immediately, it says, and immediately when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue. Immediately, suddenly, at once. This is now the fifth time that he uses this same word, immediately. Unfortunately, I again say that you'll have to look from translation to translation, but I basically I've used a, a Greek text to see where he's saying this. And so when it doesn't show immediately, then I'll tell you it's immediately. But immediately on the, when the Sabbath came, now it, it doesn't mean that the Sabbath day was not there because he's already identified as the Sabbath day, but when the time for the meeting of people on the Sabbath, when the Sabbath came, it's like saying it's Sabbath. Some people say I'm going to worship today. Well, it, they're using it not as a a, not as an idea of what they're going to do, but it's a place where they go. And so we come to worship today. Where, where are you going to be at 1030? Well, I'm going to be at worship. And so as a result, it's the same kind of idea. So now the time, the time for the meeting has started. And Jesus is taking these men with him. They're not, on, they're not on, uh, uncomfortable being in the synagogue. In fact, they've been in the synagogue before. In fact, it may be a little strange that these four guys are coming to church. Oh, excuse me to synagogue on this particular day. This wasn't 150 miles away from where they were fishermen. Can you imagine you know, that feeling when you see that person coming to church today? He's here? 
This is what we've been praying for. But he's here today. Why is he here? Why are you here today? And here they come in and they went in. I, I don't know what the trepidation perhaps they had or what they were thinking, but here they are following Jesus and he's going right into the synagogue. And it says he began to teach. Now you notice here Mark doesn't give any precision on what he taught on. We're always wondering, what text is he talking about? And we try to look synoptically again and see if this is the same time when Jesus read from Isaiah and he said, today these things are fulfilled in your hearing. We find that was in another place. It wasn't in the same place that we're talking about today. So it's not the same event. But Mark is not so concerned about what Jesus spoke upon, but it, that how he spoke. What was the first message that you ever heard as a Christian? What was the message you were listening to when you became a Christian? What was the person talking about from the Scriptures that they probably shared with you when you were saved? Do you remember? Or do you just remember this moment when I was touched by heaven? And something happened to me. And we say it that way. Our testimony is, something happened. Something happened. And here they are, following Jesus on the Sabbath day into the synagogue, in Capernaum, and he began to teach. And as he taught, it says the people were amazed at his teaching. Now this word amazed is an amazing word. Today we love to say, that's amazing. That's amazing. Everywhere you hear it. In fact, I start saying, I think, stop saying that and don't say at the end of the day and don't say all these things. Stop it. Use the English language, don't be all the art, you know, the jargon we can find. But it says that they were amazed. Now, what does that word amazed actually mean? Well, it's a word that literally means to strike someone physically, to literally hit them. But it was not used in that physical impact upon a person. It has the same kind of impact upon their thinking, their internal person. It means to strike out. To force a blow upon somebody, be found only in the sense of knocking out his opponent. Self-possession, to strike with astonishment, terror, admiration. We see this so many times in the ministry of Jesus. And we see it particularly in Mark as he speaks and people have this reaction to him. And it's such an amazing, there we go. It's such a terrible act, reaction you know, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Scripture says. What does that mean? Is that an intellectual thought? Is it intellectual? Well, you know, let's, let's learn, turn to all the places where it says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and we'll look at that, and we'll talk about the idea of being in awe of God. And we'll look at all the Scriptures, and we'll hear them all, and we'll parse them, and we'll understand in our head how that is, right? But when something is amazing... It's when it goes beyond that, when it hits us not from the outside in which we you know, kind of incorporate into our thinking we, and we muse upon it and then we make a decision about it. Something that is amazing, something that causes internal upheaval within us. The kingdom of God comes upon people violently and brings a violent reaction to their lives. I know in a personal way, I can't speak for you, but I know in my life, there was a violence that day. A sense that everything was in, in a place of flux and a place of change. And, but I wasn't, I wasn't scared because I, I knew who I was being drawn by. As long as he was there, everything had some sense to it. And here we see him going and just preaching a sermon as a result of just preaching a sermon. Well, it says he actually started teaching. Just teaching. This brought an amazement, a violence upon his audience. And why? Because he taught at them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Mark's emphasis in this comparison with the scribes, the word is scribes, teachers of the law, is a statement that helps us in English, but it means the scribes, the persons who kept the law correctly. And they were the copyists, and they were the ones who 
outline things of behavior, and they, especially in the law, when the Ten Commandments start coming into a more of a, of a purposeful use. In other words, they're using them to uh, bring justice in, court, in their courts and so forth. As they expanded into a huge body of law literature, the scribes then took these and they carefully put them in forms that were easy to get to, easy to understand. And the scribes, he says, these teachers of the law, as he said, Jesus is teaching in a different way than these teachers of the law, these scribes. Was it his voice? Was it his looks? Was it that hair? Was it his glasses? Uh, no, no. What was it about him that day? What is about him that they suddenly were amazed? They were literally coming to a place of awe. Yes, him. It was his presence. It was who he was. It was, his, it was, it was just oozing out. It was the one who had words that the sense was they ran very close to the heart of God. In fact, as they thought and kept, he just kept listening and think, this is the, this is the voice of God. Clearly, Mark is showing this reaction, this, of this person. Not to his sermons, not to the logic of his sermon, how tactful he was, but to him personally. There's an illustration in the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon that, that kind of captures this. Joseph Parker was a Baptist preacher in, in England, very famous, worldwide, well-known Baptist preacher. And people came from far and wide to hear the voice of Joseph Parker. He had a very beautiful voice. He had a great demeanor. He was tall. He was handsome. He was articulate. He was a, a wordsmith. And people would come and they'd want to hear Joseph Parker. And as the story goes, a group of Americans came to, the, to England specifically to hear some of the great preachers of the time. And they went to hear Joseph Parker in the morning. And as they came from the sermon, they said, what a great speaker is Joseph Parker. And then that late afternoon, they went to the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle and they heard Charles Haddon Spurgeon speak. And he also had a beautiful voice and he had a demeanor and he had the same kind of things they had noticed in Joseph Parker. And as they came from that place, they said among themselves, what a great Savior is Jesus Christ. It's a distinction, isn't it? Do we want to hear someone speak great? Or do we want to hear the great person they're speaking about? And Jesus was this reflector, this absolute, perfect, unblemished, perfecter of God's image and his person is non-sinner born into a world conceived without sin in his nature as a result the things that came from his mouth had authority words to invoke an eternal heart response this fear and amazement rushed upon these people and we solicited an eternal response from them. Look at that language. The people were amazed at his teaching because it was not like the scribes. It was different. And then Mark uses the word he's used before immediately. Just as he was speaking, immediately something happened. In verse 23, it says, Then, just then, immediately a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, first of all, there's a little kind of interesting thing. It says, Just then a man in their synagogue. It doesn't say a man visiting their synagogue. It doesn't say a man that came. They don't know who Jesus is. Jesus just walks in with his four guys. They don't know who Jesus is. No one else knows who Jesus is. And as he started teaching, which was not an uncommon practice in Jewish synagogues, 
for a person to stand, and when they stand, they are allowed to speak. When he spoke, this person in the synagogue, one of the people in the synagogue, maybe he's been there for a long time. I mean, everybody comes to church, it's not perfect, right? Right? No, maybe this is not, maybe this church, I guess. If that's true, I'm the only one <laughs> this applies to. Of course not. There's, we, we find ourselves in a place of struggle all the time. You notice it doesn't say here that what happened to him is this person um, possessed by an impure spirit. It's not some gnarly, you know, grotesque thing. It's not like the guy out in Gennesaret, you know, that Jesus meets later who's chained to a, 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 ca- a, a cave because he's so filled with demons and he's screaming out and he's naked and he's violent. He breaks the chains and he tears his own skin. You know, that's what we think about a demon-possessed person. This person's not possessed by some kind of, that kind of situation. He's possessed by an impure spirit. Uh, it's getting a little too close, Jesus. You know, I thought, you know, I, I see dem- demons when I, when I know them. They're, they're really bad. That person's really messed up. What about my impurities? An impure spirit? What about a, Paul talked about this, a spirit that has pride, that, that he calls it craving your neighbor's possessions. He, that's his illustration. As he's talking about his own life and the things that we find in internal sins, what about craving other people's things? What about envy? Is there some big gnarly spirit? What about greed? We very rarely see that one. Especially the money that might come out of that person because they don't give any money. They're greedy. They're holding it for themselves. But you see what I'm saying? It's like he's going into a synagogue and there's a person that's been there already. Perhaps even, you know, who knows? He may be one of the leaders. Of this. I don't know. doesn't say. It doesn't give us any evidence. So he's, he's one of them. Isn't that what you're reading there? They was someone who was in their synagogue, yet living within the context of the religious system. Yet he was a man who was possessed by a spirit of impurity. He cried out. He had just about enough of all this. Just about enough. I always say, well, if I ever went to a church and they started preaching like that, I'd just stand up and say something. Well, be careful. <laughs> you know, if Jesus is speaking, be careful. Because well, you might stand up and say something that identifies you as having a problem. That's just, not just an outspoken person. This person has come to a place as everyone's being amazed. He's being convicted deeply. Impurity. Of his spirit. The lust of the flesh. John says in 1 John. Chapter 2 verse 15. The lust of the flesh. This passion for the flesh. Cried out. What do you want from us? Notice this case. What do you want from us? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. See, think of that case, plural and then singular. It's an amazing little phrase. He's not saying that one of these problems is crying out to him. The problem is multiple. The spirit of impurity can be a whole host of things. These hosts are within this person. Do you ever feel like that's your struggling all the time with something? Do you feel that way ever? You can't quite get over the thing, way you just go off into something you wish you hadn't started thinking about. Or you have a tendency to kind of be thrilled or drawn away by something. And it's been that way your entire life. You know. I know. But he cried out and he said, what do you want with us Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? And then the man, I know who you are, the Holy One of God.
Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. What does that, what is that you know, solicit in our thinking? Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God, and the man from Nazareth. What, what do you see when you see the man from Nazareth and the Holy One of God? What comes to your theological mind when you see that? What makes Jesus so unique is his incarnate nature. What they're observing is a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who we find later, some of the people identify him as the, isn't this Joseph's kid? Isn't this Mary's kid? Isn't that their bastard child? Isn't, what are your expectations from a bastard child? Literally comes out in that kind of a awful context. But here these spirits recognize a man and they recognize God. Sharing the same nature. Doesn't mean that you know, spirits are you know, somehow teetering between goodness and bad. They're fallen angels. They're fallen creatures. But they see things that often we don't see because we are dead of spirit. We're dead of spirit. And so as a result, we see this incarnation, this unique birth and conception of Jesus Christ. He's born of the Virgin Mary. He is conceived of the Holy Spirit. And what is within him, it says, is God. The Word of God, as John chapter 1 tells us. And the man, the flesh, came together into one person. They shared this nature. And the purpose of the human nature was to be prepared to die and atone for our sins. And the purpose, it says in Philippians, of the Word of God, the second member of the Trinity, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, the eternal Son, his task was to come and to humble himself and serve this purpose of preparation of this Lamb of God. And they saw it. What would make him even, what would make him unique? What would what make anybody think he's just unique? Well, great speaker, but we never say, oh man, you must be God. But they had that sense. The one they're listening to, this goes beyond my senses because I'm seeing a man speak, but I hear God. This isn't the God that I've been told by the Pharisees, I mean, the, the, the scribes, that scribes prepare the Pharisees to have all this equipment to walk around and try to live out the law and then accuse everybody else of not living the law. That's the, that's the nature of the whole context of how the people of Israel lived. Is they, when it came into a religious form, they felt guilty. They felt pressed. They felt someone was in their face all the time. Here they're hearing someone speak. This, even this possessed person, he's amazed. <laughs> Be quiet. Jesus said sternly, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. You ever heard a shriek? It can be blood curdling. I know I used to, when I was doing landscaping, I was one time assigned to go early and pull out all the hoses at the, at the, the um, lion house down in the zoo. We were putting the landscaping, last section of landscaping in. And the cages were always empty. You know, there was never any animals in there. We were just working till you know, got all the landscaping in, and the animals eventually were going to put in there. And so I'm just down there at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's kind of dark. It's actually, it's, yeah, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. It started at 7. So I'm pulling these hoses out. I'm trying to, now I remember I was over on this thing and I was leaning down like this and I was, you know, trying to, let's see, which way does it go? You know, this way. All right. This, it, it, hooking up the hose. All of a sudden, I can still kind of hear it. It was, wow! <laughs> noise. I mean, 10 times louder than that. And man, I just went, oh, I think I froze that hose, you know what I mean? <laughs> Halfway down. And I, and I just went like this. I went, oh, what is this? Well, there's the area you can walk around in this interior area. And then there's a long chain link fence to the ceiling. And then there's another place you can walk around. And then there's a cage. And then the cage is where the tigers and lions are. And panthers. 
And this was a black panther. He's up there, he goes. <laughs> I thought, man, I wonder what he was thinking. This looks good. Maybe he was giving praise to God for, he's a Christian panther, who knows? He's saying his blessing before he got ready to eat me. I mean, just the shriek. That wasn't just kind of a little, <laughs> oh, what's around here? That was a, I am here and I'm leaving in protest. And this creature shrieked as he left this man. That's nice thing to have in church, right? You go home and say, how was church today? Oh, man, I'm not sure I want to go back there. You know, well, something's going on. But I got a few people I need to call before, you know, the evening service. I want to just make sure that they know this story just happened. <laughs> Again, the people were amazed. Same context, same word as used above. You continue to be amazed by this. It's not just, well, that's really cool. I'm so glad brother, you know, you know, lust man has gotten himself fixed. You know, when you see something taking place in somebody else, do you think about me? I got that problem too. Maybe I'm next. And they asked each other, what is this? What is this? What's going on here? I was comfortable here. I like scribes. I like the, you know, the systematic, you know, discovery of scripture. I like the intellectual stuff. Man, this guy's real. It's a new teaching. Now, this word, a new teaching, it's, it's again, I, the English language is used as effectively as it can be, but it means not some new teaching as if, you know, hey, it's, a, it's, it's something we haven't heard before. No, this is the, he hasn't really told us what he's teaching. But it's the way he's teaching. It's prophet has come among us again and he's crying out in God's power repent turn to him this is not just teaching it's teaching with authority behind it there's what is what does that mean what does it mean to you when you think about authority behind it someone who's living it, someone who is it. The amazing thing is the word is before them, not just the words he's saying, the word himself has come. Isn't that amazing? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. Immediately says news about him spread quickly I bet it did I bet those people ran out of that place and they were trying to find the next person they could tell this story to tells us that when George Whitfield preached and why am I forgetting the name it's just a small town just north uh, Hampton Northampton when he preached in Northampton in the Northampton church and he preached the gospel for the first time and those Puritan persons who were raised in the great doctrines of the Puritan tradition, Reformed tradition, they heard all the words, all the, got all the systems, they got all the analogy, got all the things in their mind, they all, got all the stuff down, you know, all their theology is pristine. But when George Whitfield preached, they felt God was speaking to them. And outside the church up there on the hill, is this little rocky little mound. And you know how you have grass, but then there's a, it's on rocks, and so you see some dirt between the rocks. And this one place, it's a, it looks just like a footprint. <laughs> and they say, when George Whitfield preached the gospel, there's a little sign there. When George Whitfield preached the gospel at this church, Satan jumped out of the bell tower and left his footprint as he was running. Jesus Christ and him crucified was his message. 
here now they're hearing this new teaching with authority. Demons, spirits, impure spirits. I didn't say demons. Impure spirits are obeying Him. They're leaving people. I remember the first, it was someone like, I think that, I remember I was with a guy named Walt Tommy and his wife Deb. He was, he was Southern, so he said Deb. Me and Deb want to go out on a date. So here we are. He had known me at Montgomery College just about three weeks before this. I was, we were classmates at Montgomery College. We went on a double date. And we're driving down. Remember, it was a rainy night. We turned right on Old Georgetown Road, went down Tuckerman Lane. You know what I'm talking about? Down underneath that bridge just before you get to the park. And he literally pulls over on this bridge. He says, what happened to you, man? I said, what are you talking about? He said, number one, all you're talking about is Jesus. And I've heard you cuss in the last 10 minutes. I didn't even think, well, I'm so glad cussing is left. I didn't even notice it. <laughs> just gone. Jesus speaks. The evil spirits flee. I mean, can you give testimony to that? I can. I can give testimony to that. They just, it's, just, it's like this, where's that go? I, I can't remember how it used to be. Because of the comparison to what is now. And news about him. Immediately it says, suddenly, at once. This is now the seventh time he uses the same words in the book of Mark. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. It's, like, it's a lot like what happened in Jerusalem. You know, the years later in Acts chapter 2, Luke captures this for us as he talks about the effect of the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came upon these persons these disciples of Jesus, there's 120 people waiting in prayer. And as a result, they rose up and not in fear, they ran out in the streets and they were calling everybody and telling them about the message of Christ. It tells us in that first portion of Acts that names about 12 different people groups that heard that message. And later, much later, we see the Apostle Paul going out. And who does he find out there? He finds Jewish people, but he finds Christians. People who are believers in Jesus Christ, where did they hear it? They heard on that day of Pentecost. Pentecost is not the verification that speaking in tongues is of God. Pray if you speak in tongues, someone will know what you're talking about. You're walking around, I speak in tongues. Well, I speak in tongues. We don't, you know, we don't say it much now. You say, do you speak in tongues? Well, you know, I wish I spoke in the tongues of every man. You can speak in... Look at this group. We, we're just kind of an illustration of it, aren't we? How many people know another language besides English? Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you, if you speak another language besides English. Well, there's only about, you know, half of us. <laughs> I mean, think of that. And it tells us that the message, the news, the good news, it was the, the glad tidings again, the gospel, spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Hmm. Well, what do we take away today with this? I think the first thing we take away is that we fit, don't we? We fit into this story, don't we? Do, do you see yourself how you fit into this story? It's there, okay. We fit into the story. This is a story... Not about Peter, Andrew, James, and John and the people in the synagogue. And, but it's a story about us. We're brought into it. And notice what Mark's response is. It's not just, they were amazed. They were all changed. The whole place was changed. It was a wonderful church after that. A wonderful synagogue. After that, the scribes didn't come and just... They invited Jesus back over and over and over again. No, it says what they received, they gave. And spread rapidly. It's the... It's the idea of what it is to share the gospel. That we don't see ourselves as people that are willing to talk about people to keep them from going to hell. We share the good news of what Christ has done in our life and how we're set free by it. And even people, we don't say everybody's just a demon-possessed person. No, but that we have troubles, we have issues, we have things in our life, and what we bring to it is one who can speak the word and they flee. 
Jesus said, you go. You go and preach this Gospel. And my Spirit will empower you to preach this Gospel. So what, there's, a, there's a half a dozen things here. Let's just take, let's take another one. Were, were these disciples, you think they were just kind of saying, well, this, this, this is what He wanted us to follow? I guess we'll just, you know, we'll, maybe we'll stay on for a while, you know. I, by the way, I go back for the, you know, the, the 10 o'clock shift, you know, for fishing. I got to go back. back. <laughs> no. They were likely the ones also that were changed. And we see in every one of their testimonies, everything they talk about, they talk about the change that was brought to them by Jesus, the Word, the Holy One of God. The man, the Holy One of God. And as a result, we are challenged not to come up, lift our game some. We're challenged to listen to him. Is this the day that God's calling you? That God's bringing things into your thoughts? What are your problems? What are your troubles? What are things that you suffer with? And lay them before him. Yes, we're saved by grace. We're saved fully. Every part of us is saved. But we continue to struggle in this tension between the coming and the fullness of the kingdom of God and the dying of the kingdom of this world around us. Even now, after all this time, we are empowered, first of all, to receive that Spirit of God into our hearts that cleanses us and purifies us and prepares us and sends us. And also to recognize that we are Christ's witnesses. He'll use us if we're sending on the holy day. He'll use us. I mean, you have to be perfect to be a Christian and a witness. I hear that all the time. I'm not really the kind of person that really as a Christian should be witnessing to anybody. Maybe you're exactly the person someone could identify with. Or maybe you're being witnessed to at that point. Either case, we see what we take away is a context in which we are fishers of men. We're fishing, aren't we? Learning how to fish. Learning how to fish. Even as a local church, learning how to fish and I've, I'll be very candid with you. I've been very, very touched by this whole thing of are we fishers of men? Are we a fishing church? You know, not you, 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 but us together. We really see ourselves as persons who are fishing here. The things we do, there's motivations to fish for people. You ever, I, 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 I came out of this on last Saturday evening, and, and I um, was talking to Karen, and I said, um, you ever gone fishing with somebody who really doesn't know anything about fishing? You ever, how many people have ever gone fishing? Okay, let me just get that. Anybody ever fished before? Now you're, all, of course, all great fishermen, right? And you, you fish all the time. And the reason I don't like going fishing is because I don't catch anything. That's why I don't go. I mean, I went with great enthusiasm. I mean, as a little boy, you know, my dad buys us rods, and after long, after long we're casting these you know, trees and pulling off apples and, you know, hitting each other and sword fighting. I mean, we're so far from fishermen, it's just incredible. <laughs> I know nothing about fishing. Didn't know how to do it. Jesus said, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men. And he takes them right into a pond filled with fish. <laughs> and he says, here's how you do the kind of fishing I'm going to do. Get out of him. With us. He, was, he was like, he was incensed, it says in the scripture. Come out of him. How dare you be in him? Get out. Well, I said, why don't you like fishing? He said, because, you know, there wasn't really any fish, I don't think, because I didn't catch any of them. And I think that we have to be sensitive. Is Jesus calling us to be fishers of men? Is he? Well, you go and do it. Well, you do not know anything about fishing. But together, maybe we can get a little pond here that if there's no fish here that are going to be, maybe some people are going to bring a couple fish. Maybe God's going to bring a few fish in here. We're going to fish. 
Amen? I mean, that's what we're called to, right? While we're, while we're living this life, we're called to fish. So why don't we fish together? So as we talk about this subject more and more, I, I believe God's going to give us a great context of fishing for men together. Amen? Praise the Lord. Are you willing to do that? You don't need to bring a pole. <laughs> that's not how you catch a fish. That's not how you catch a man. It's time to stop talking, John.